Okay, so I think it's a time for us to, to start the session. And the first speaker is Zoran Huang, and he will talk about the unbeam angle analysis of B to D star L nu. So you can start now. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of uh, Left Photon 2021. It's my great pleasure to give this presentation. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the unbeamed angular analysis of B2D style new and the right-handed current, which is based on the work in collaboration with Amy Ko, Cai Dian Lu, and uh, Ru Ying Tang. Uh, as we know, in recent years, the semi-leptonic B2D or D style new decays have gained uh, considerable attention, mainly because of some discrepancies between the standard uh, experimental measurements and the standard model predictions, including the so-called RDRD star anomalies uh, and the VCB puzzle. Um, uh, although uh, uh, these problems has been mentioned by uh, other speakers, I'll still uh, briefly introduce them. Uh, the RDRD star are defined as the ratios of the decay rate of B2 uh, D or D star tau nu to the uh, decay rate of B2 D or D star L nu with L being muon or electron. Um, such ratios are considered as uh, the, uh, uh, clean observables uh, be, uh, because the uh, theoretical uncertainties gets largely canceled. Uh, from this plot on the right, uh, we can see that the combined results of Barbara and Bell and HCB deviate from the standard model by about 3.4 sigma. Uh, such a deviation gives a hint of the so-called gives a hint of the so-called lepton flavor a violation of lepton flavor universality because these ratios are uh, tau to mu or e ratios. Uh, the, the the VCB puzzle uh, is the tension between the values of the uh, CK matrix element of VCB uh, from uh, the, uh, extracted from inclusive and uh, exclusive decays. Uh, in, uh, for the inclusive decay, all final hadrons containing a C quark are summed over. Uh, the decay rate can be computed to good pre, uh, pre, uh, precision uh, with the help of, uh, in an expansion uh, of, uh, in alpha S and one over MC or MB with the help of uh, heavy quark expansion, optical theorem, and the uh, operator product expansion. Uh, while for the exclusive decay, uh, only specified hadrons are considered, uh, which in our case are D or D star. The, the de therefore, the decay rate, um, uh, uh, decay rate receives large uncertainties from the hadronic form factors, although the decay rates are, uh, although uh, the exclusive decays are uh, easier to, uh, to measure experimentally. Uh, at the present stage, uh, the tension in VCB uh, is also uh, at the level of three sigma, uh, which can be induced by either the theoretical uh, and the experimental uncertainties or new physics beyond the standard model. Um, the simplest uh, possible, uh, the simplest consideration of the uh, explanation of the VCB puzzle is the right-handed vector current, uh, as shown uh, in the uh, weak effective Hamiltonian. Uh, in charge of uh, B2CL new decay. Uh, here's uh, OVL is the left-handed vector current or the V minus A current in the standard model. The uh, OVR is the right-handed vector current, which can be obtained uh, from the uh, OVL by uh, flipping uh, the chiral chirality of quark anti-quark fields. Uh, the, uh, the Wilson coefficients corresponding to OVL and OVR are respectively CVL and CVR. In the standard model, we have CVL equal to one and CVR equal to zero. Uh, but in some new physics models, uh, for example, the, in the left to right symmetric model uh, from left and right handed double mixing, non zero CVR can be induced. Uh, in this plot on the left, uh, this plot on the left shows the um, extracted VCB uh, versus uh, CVR. Uh, here, the blue band represents the, the inclusive decay, the red band is the uh, B to D L new exclusive decay and the yellow band is the uh, B to D star L new decay. We can see that to simultaneously explain B to D L new and uh, the inclusive decay CVR is required to be minus five percent. To explain B to D star L new and uh, uh, the inclusive decay CVR is required to be five percent. Therefore, at the present stage, the ve uh, right-handed vector current can only simultaneously explain uh, two process of the uh, two processes of the three. But remember, all these measurements have considerable uncertainties, and there is also theoretical uncertainty from lattice QCD, uh, lattice QCD input. Uh, so uh, the situation could change once we have an uh, update uh, of this uh, measurement and uh, theoretical uh, and the lattice QCD. 
Um, th therefore, definitely we need more measurements. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, the right-handed uh, the right-handed vector current itself is worth examining uh, for its uh, the simple extension of the standard model. Uh, in our work, we propose to do an unbinded angular analysis to, to measure CVR. Before introducing the unbinded angular analysis, let me uh, first uh, illustrate uh, the basic theoretical framework. Um, as we know, the differential decay rate of B to D star L nu, uh, D star to D pi decay in terms of the momentum transfer and three kinematic angles can be uh, expressed in terms of 12 independent uh, angular observables, namely the so-called uh, J parameters. Uh, these J parameters are experimentally measurable and they are functions of the helicity amplitudes, uh, including H plus H minus H zero and uh, the Wilson coefficients, which in our case are CVL and CVR. The helicity amplitudes can be further uh, expressed uh, in terms of the hadronic uh, form factors. Uh, therefore, we can relate this uh, differential decay rate uh, to the hadronic form factors and the Wilson coefficients. Uh, this plot shows more explicitly the three kinematic angles. Here, theta v is the angle between d and d star in the d star rest frame. Uh, the theta l is the angle between the charge lepton and the virtual w in the w rest frame. Uh, chi is the tilting angle between the, uh, between the leptonic and the hadronic planes. These three kinematic angles, together with uh, the momentum transfer w, can describe the B to D star L nu four body decays. As I said, uh, the holistic amplitudes are functions of the ha hadronic form factors. In order to uh, express the hadronic form factors in the full Q square range, we need a parameterization for the uh, B to D star form factors. Uh, in the uh, we, in our work, we studied the two most commonly used uh, uh, parameterizations, the CLM parameterization and the BGL uh, parameterization. The CLM parameterization is based on the heavy quark expansion. Under heavy quark symmetry, uh, the hadronic form factors of uh, B2D star are related to each other. Therefore, the number of, uh, uh, the number of uh, free parameters can be reduced. And we, uh, for B2D star, we only need four uh, parameters. Uh, they are the... Um, the uh, axial vector form factor at zero recoil HA11, uh, the slope parameter rho d star, and the two form factor ratios at zero recoil R11 and R21. The BGL parameterization is based on the analytic, analy, analy, analytic properties uh, of uh, uh, hadronic form factors. Uh, therefore, it's maximally model independent, but has more free parameters. Um, these are the expressions for the B2D star form factors. Uh, in the BGL parameterization uh, here. Uh, these uh, P factors are called the Blesch factors, uh, uh, which include the sub-threshold P sub C pose. Uh, the, uh, the, these five functions are outer functions, uh, which can be calculated via OPE and the dis dispersion relation. Um, the re remaining parts are, analy uh, are analytic and uh, can be expanded in, in Z and truncated at, at some order because Z is much smaller than one. And these expansion uh, parameters, uh, including uh, such as uh, AG0, AG1, a, AG2, AF0, AF1, et cetera, uh, are, the, are, the free, are the free parameters in the BGL parameterization. Um, then uh, having introduced the, the, the theoretical framework, let me, um, let me present the sensitivity study uh, for the unbinned angular analysis. In fact, uh, there are already uh, there are already uh, e uh, experimental analysis by Bell and Babar for the B two D style new B two D style new decay. Uh, those analyses are binned analysis, which means the data are binned in each of the uh, kinematical angles and the momentum transfer and the chi square projected to each of these parameters is utilized in the fit. Unlike the binned analysis, in the unbinned analysis, the measured uh, experimental like uh, the measured values are obtained by maximizing the li uh, log likelihood function, which is summed event by event. Uh, therefore, the, in such a way, the full angular information can be used and, uh, and such analysis is expected to be uh, more sensitive to any uh, new physics effects. Uh, in the log likelihood function, we need, to deal, we need to deal with the normalized probability density function which can be obtained by normalizing the uh, angular decay distribution. So uh, such that the, the probability in full space is a unity. Um, 
so in the normalized PDF, uh, we, we need to deal with the uh, normalized uh, angular observables, the, uh, namely the uh, G parameters, uh, which are the, the original J parameters uh, divided by a normalization factor. And these G parameters can be obtained by uh, the maximum likelihood method uh, and then and then used to uh, used to fit the form factors and the, the Wilson coefficients, including CVR, uh, because they are functions of the form factors and uh, the Wilson coefficients. Uh, because uh, because the uh, the overall factor of G, uh, G parameters uh, gets cancelled in the uh, uh, including VCB gets cancelled uh, in the uh, G functions uh, by taking the ratio. Uh, the the, in, the, in de, the uh, determination of uh, CVR would be independent of the con uh, controversial value of BCB. Uh, to perform a sensitivity study, we need to uh, generate pseudo data for the G parameters. In our study, we uh, generated 10 bins of G parameters using the uh, hydronic form factors measured by Bell in both CLN and BGL parameterizations. Uh, and we generated uh, the, this G uh, the, the covariance matrices of these G parameters using the Toy Monte Carlo, me uh, Toy Monte Carlo method. In the Toy Monte Carlo, we set uh, the total event number to be 95K as in the bell bin analysis. That, therefore, we can obtain the, pre uh, the, the, the expected precision of CVR uh, for an unbind analysis at bell. So this plot shows the uh, generated uh, uh, generated G parameters in 10 things. We can see that this G6C, G7, G8, and G9 are, are zero. Uh, but in fact, G6C and G7 uh, receive no contribution from both left-handed and right-handed currents. But G8 and G9 can be non-zero if there is an imaginary part of CVR. So they are useful to, uh, uh, to measure the uh, imaginary part of CVR and uh, uh, study uh, the CP violation. Three minutes um, left. Okay. Uh, then, uh, have, having this uh, pseudo data, we, uh, we can uh, fit form factor, hydronic form factors, and CVR. Uh, it should be noted that CVR cannot be de uh, be determined uh, using only uh, using only W bins of the decay rate because uh, without knowing VCB precisely, because uh, the CVR is highly correlated. Uh, CVR and VCB are uh, strongly correlated as they both uh, directly impact the decay rate. Uh, that's why we need the angular observables to, to, to fit the angular observables. Uh, in addition to the angular part in the Q square, we also use the, the available lattice data for HA11 as uh, done in the Bell analysis. But with this uh, data, the, uh, uh, the angular fit still doesn't converge because CVR is also uh, highly correlated to the uh, vector form factor. Uh, therefore, we also need the lattice input of the vector form factor to, to determine CVR. In our study, we uh, use the central values of the uh, of R11 and the HV1 um, measured by Bell and assign them the errors expected from lattice QCD to, to, to perform a sensitivity study. Uh, then let's turn to the results of the sensitivity study. Um, in the, uh, for the BGL, uh, for the CLN fit, as I said, we assign a 4% error for R11. And uh, we found, although we uh, although the error for uh, for the slope parameter rho d star is large, uh, the precision for CVR is uh, quite good, which is all, uh, about uh, two uh, two percent. Also, we found the correlation between CVR and R11 is quite large. Uh, this further further explains why we need R11 uh, to be determined from uh, lattice QCD. The BGL results are quite similar. We got very uh, a large error for one of the form factor parameters AF1. But the error for uh, but the, the precision for CVR is quite good, which is less than than four percent, and the correlation between uh, uh, CVR and the uh, uh, the vector form factor is also very large. Uh, in addition to the uh, real part of CVR, we also studied the imaginary part of CVR. We found that the imaginary part can be determined to precision of uh, zero point seven uh, uh, percent for both CLN and BGL, which means the um, the angular analysis is very useful for determining the imaginary part of CVR. The correlation can be uh, uh, the correlation between uh, the vector form factors and the, the CVR can be uh, better seen in these uh, counterplots. 
the strong correlation uh, suggests that if lattice results turn out to be different from the experimental measure values, non-CVR can be hinted. For example, if R11, the lattice value of R11 is greater than 1.3 and the uh, HV1 is uh, larger than 1.2, uh, a negative CVR can be hinted. In addition to the, uh, to the full angular analysis, we, we also studied the, uh, the role of the forward backward over the symmetry in determining CVR. Uh, the forward backward symmetry turns out to be uh, proportional to G6S and it only requires one angle measurement. As for the uh, G parameters, we also made uh, 10 bins for the uh, forward backward symmetry and we found that the precision for CVR is quite good. CVR can be determined at, uh, to precision of 2.2% for CON and 4% for BGL uh, uh, using the uh, AFB alone. Uh, also, the correlation between the uh, hydronic uh, between the CVR and the, the uh, vector form factor is very large, which means we also need a lattice input of uh, 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 the vector form factor to de to determine CVR by uh, measuring uh, AFB. Uh, then, let me summarize the talk. Uh, we performed a sensitivity study for the um, bend angular analysis of the B two D star L new D star to D pi K. We found the normalized uh, angular observables are very useful for the measurement of CVR by circumventing the VCB puzzle. As we, uh, an important finding for the unbind angular analysis is that CVR is co highly correlated to the, the vector form factor. Therefore, it can only be determined if we know the vector form factor from lattice QCD. Um, in our uh, sensitivity study, uh, we found the real parts uh, part of CVR can be determined to precision of two to 4% and the, the imaginary part can be determined to uh, 1%. Uh, using the full uh, angular observables, uh, having in mind that uh, the, uh, to simultaneously explain B2D star L new and the inclusive decay, uh, we need a 5% CVR. Uh, such precision is uh, still quite meaningful. Last but uh, equally important is that uh, the forward backward symmetry alone can constrain CVR to precision, uh, which is close to uh, that obtained by the full angular analysis. Therefore, we highly recommend to do this uh, single measurement in the near future. That's all for my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello? I can hear you still. Can, I think the chair, the chair is frozen. No. Can you hear me? Um, so I, I, I will act as a backup chair then. Uh, thank you very much for your for your talk. Uh, are there any questions? Please raise your hand. Is there any questions? And please give me a note if, if you are back at your one. So okay, then I will, I will start with a question. So what, um, what information from the lattice would be most useful for you, like um, the Q square dependence also, or a, a certain point? Uh, I think it's uh, the, the, the... The, the, the lattice result for this vector form factors as zero recoil, it's, uh, I mean, already very useful for determining CVR. We only uh, added uh, those uh, information in our study. I see. Very yeah, good. for zero recoil. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? I don't see Can you any. hear me now? Okay, so I'll give back to you. Um, I just acted as backup chair. So back oh, to chair one. Thank you. Thank you. So if no more questions, let's move to the second talk. So the second speaker is William Parrott. He would talk about the improved VCS determination and the search for new physics. Uh, yes. Um, can everyone see this? Yes. Just go ahead. So I will remind you. Yep. When you okay, start. great. Um, hi. Uh, I, 
five minutes. Okay, cheers. Uh, hi, I'm Well from the University of Glasgow. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about you and the BTK LL bar. Um, and this is something I've been working along uh, as part of the HPQCD collaboration, uh, along with these authors here. Um, the first part of the talk is going to be about D to K, and there I'm going to summarize the results in this paper here. Uh, the second part will be about B to K, which uh, is not yet published, but hopefully will be shortly. Um, so I'm going to run you through the D to K motivation, uh, how we calculate hadronic form factors on the lattice, give you some results there uh, for the form factors, and then how we uh, use three semi-independent methods to get from these form factors to uh, the VCS determination. Uh, then I'm going to move on to BTK and then give you some preliminary BTK form factor results and some phenomenology associated with those. Uh, so this is the Feynman diagram for DTK. Um, there's a, this flavor change, obviously, and there's an associated um, CKM matrix element, in this case, VCS. Um, and as we know, in the standard model, uh, the CKM matrix is unitary. Uh, and a good way to test the standard model is to check that unitarity. Uh, using independent determinations of the matrix elements, um, which is exactly what we're going to do here. We can calculate the hadronic part of this on the lattice. Uh, we can compare with experiment and we can extract the VCS determination from that. Um, it's worth noting that VCS is obviously one of the elements which is close to one and therefore uh, it's important to have a good precision on it because otherwise it drowns out the other elements in its unitarity tests. So it's particularly important to drive down the uncertainty on VCS. Um, so what are these form factors? Um, they, ar they arise in places, um, for example, in this differential decay rate for DTK. This is just a truncated version I've got here. I'll show you the full one later. Uh, this involves the vector form factor or the F plus. Uh, they parameterize the QCD bit, if you like. They tell us things about the meson structure and describe the shape in Q squared space, where this is the uh, difference in four momenta between the, the D and the K in this case. Uh, for DTK, we're going to be interested in the F plus and the F naught, so the vector and the scalar form factors, and we'll calculate both of those. And we can construct these from uh, three point functions, which we calculate on the lattice. Uh, here's just a schematic of a three point, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, so why do we use the lattice? Well, it's the first principles methods to determine two and three point correlation functions. Um, the computational cost of this is very large and it grows with um, lighter masses and finer lattices. So um, I should mention at this point, actually, that we're calling the lattice spacing A, um, so which will crop up later. Um, but for D to K in particular, to do a good calculation, we need to include um, physical light quarks in the calculation at physical mass. They're obviously more expensive um, than heavier quarks. So that's one of the reasons this is a, a, an expensive calculation. Uh, and I should say at this point, we don't consider QED um, and isospin breaking effects. And that's the sort of next step really, uh, but that's a whole new generation of calculation would be required to do that. Um, so that's some that's a limitation, if you like, of the method at the moment. Um, so we want to get these form factors over the full Q squared range. Uh, in order to do this, we construct three point correlation functions, as I say, like this. Uh, we start with the K-on, um, propagate the light quark, the spectator, propagate the strange quark. Then we'll insert a current here, which I'm calling J. That would be either a scalar or a vector current uh, in the case of the scalar or vector form factors. And then we propagate the charm to the D end. And just um, for that, if people were using multiple capital T and T naught values to increase our statistics here. Um, again, this slide is mainly for lattice people, just a bit of extra detail. Um, we're using milk HISC 2 plus 1 plus 1 ensembles. It means all the valence and sequarks are HISC. We've got five different lattice spacings in this range. Um, and on each spacing, we have an ensemble with the strange over the light mass is five. So it's a fifth of the strange, the light mass. And on the course is three, we additionally have an ensemble uh, with physical light quarks. So that's a total of eight ensembles there. The charm mass, uh, very easy to reach for us and uh, small discretization effects associated with this in the HISC action. Uh, we can cover the full Q squared range using twisted boundary conditions on the door to quark. And we non-perturbatively renormalize the vector current using the partially conserved vector current here. 
So once we've done that, we've got our data on each of the ensembles and we need to work our way from the, the uh, non-zero lattice spacings to the physical point, i.e. zero lattice spacing and physical masses. Uh, to do this, we use the Z expansion, which is pretty standard. Uh, we're using the BCL parameterization with additional discretization effects. Um, Z, uh, if you don't know, is just a, a mapping of Q squared to the unit circle in the complex plane. Um, and once we've done that, we can write our form factors as polynomials in Z. We take out a couple of factors out the front. This L is a chiral logarithm to allow for the fact that we have those different light quark masses. We got the fifth, the mass of the strange and the physical ones, and we want to extrapolate through those to the, the physical point. Uh, we also have these poles we take out. Um, and then we've got the Z expansion with coefficient AN. Uh, in each of these, we have a term to account for quark mistunings um, for the masses. And we have this discretization effects, um, which go like AMC squared. And then in the continuum, we can just set this to zero, set A to zero, and we recover the continuum form factors, which is exactly what these plots show. These are the F plus and the F naught in Q squared. Uh, here's the data from each of our eight ensembles, and the colored bands here are the continuum results for the form factors. Um, you can see that everything sits very nicely over the top of everything else here. And that's basically in the fact that we're working out the physical charm mass and that the discretization effects are very small. So there's nothing really separating the, the different uh, lattice spacings here. And because we have this full Q squared range, uh, that enables us to compare with the full Q squared range of experimental results which are available. <coughs> so um, if we're moving on to, to, we want to compare with the experiment, we need to access the differential decay rate. Uh, here's the full expression. You can see our form factors appear here and here. The F naught um, is obviously highly suppressed by this um, factor of the lepton mass squared. So for electrons and muons, that's very small, but we do include it. Um, we know everything else on this side. We measure this experimentally, or this is measured experimentally, and then we can extract VCS uh, by dividing through. Uh, a couple of extra terms that we've included here that have previously been neglected. Uh, this each for electra weak, which is a correction to the Fermi constant um, that allows for standard model um, box diagrams, I believe. And um, delta electromagnetism, which is for final state electromagnetic interactions. Um, this isn't well known, and we allow an uncertainty here. It's larger for the charged K on than the neutral. Uh, so we add these two terms in here, and then we can proceed to extract VCS uh, in three semi-independent ways. Uh, the first of these is to use the binned differential decay rate data for, from different experiments. On each bin, we can integrate our um, differential decay rate, divide through, and we can obtain an estimate, of v, well, obtain a value for VCS in each bin, which is what's shown here. Um, you can see in each bin that the theoretical uncertainty is now much smaller than the experimental one. Uh, however, uh, ultimately, the theory is still slightly larger than experiment because we average over these bins and we can then average over these four experimental sets of data here um, to obtain a final result for that, uh, which is what I show you here. These are those four experiments and there is, here's the average. We also looked at this other best experiment here, but we didn't have data to correlate it, so we didn't include it in our average. Um, and we've been able to access, in this case, uh, two different channels. So the two different charges on the mesons, but both case to electrons. Uh, this is our preferred method for doing the uh, determination because it includes the bin data across the full Q squared range. Uh, the second method um, is to integrate over the full Q squared range to obtain the branching fraction. Uh, and then there's experimental data for this. In this case, we've got access to all four channels, so the different charges on the mesons and electrons and muons available. Uh, and we obtain a similar result this way. Uh, so I say these methods are semi-independent. That's, of course, because we're using the same form factors, albeit in a slightly different way. And some of the experiments overlap with um, the three methods. So, you know, hence they're semi-independent determinations. Uh, the third is to use this VCS times the vector at Q squared naught. We've obviously calculated this, so we can just uh, take this value, uh, which is determined experimentally and um, averaged helpfully by HFLAV and divide through by RF plus to obtain VCS. Again, slightly different combination of experiments, three channels available here, 
and again, a consistent result. Putting all those results together, this is our preferred one using the bins differential decay rate data. Uh, you can see it agrees very well with the other two methods uh, and indeed with previous determinations. Uh, and in particular, I should note, it's much more precise than the, the current PDG value, which will hopefully be updated with this soon. A um, little bit of a breakdown on the uncertainty now. Uh, the lattice is still larger than experiment, as I say, but it's no longer um, absolutely dominating this. It's only a little bit larger. And we now have this other considerable uncertainty here, particularly from delta electromagnetism, uh, which needs to be determined more precisely. Uh, that's now a bit of a limiting factor. As you can see, it's slightly bigger than experimental uncertainty, in fact. Um, so that's D to K. Um, we'll move on to B to K, very similar. Uh, except now, of course, we have um, a flavor change in neutral current. This is uh, leads to loops in the standard model. Uh, this is one such loop that you could have. Um, and again, we all know these loops, good places to look for new physics. Been mentioned in a few talks yesterday. Uh, thank you. Um, so in order to move from D to K to B to K, we're unable to access the B mass directly on our ensembles. Um, we can get very close to it on our finest ones. But so what we do is use a proxy for the B mass, which is just a heavy mass MH, which takes several values on each ensemble between the charm mass and 0.8. Um, and then we can perform a fit in the heavy mass in order to get to the physical B. This is just a sort of plot to show you that these are the different masses we've got on all of the different sets. And then we move down to the physical point here at the B mass. We also include the tensor form factor for the B to K, um, normalized using this paper. And we're using the same lattice spacings as before, the same deal with the three physical light quark ensembles. Uh, and I won't talk about this, but we also include some extra third value of the ML, um, which is equal to the strange mass. Um, so we need to, the Z expansion, not going to talk you through the whole thing, um, but similar to the DTK case, uh, the main difference here is that we're now including uh, an extrapolation in the heavy mass, which is an HQET inspired um, polynomial in the inverse heavy mass here, which allows us to fit all those different heavy masses and to uh, then evaluate at the B mass or indeed any mass we should choose. Uh, these are the results in Z space with the poles removed for the three form factors, scalar vector tensor, uh, and as I say, the difference with D to K here is they're no longer sat all over the top of each other as they were before. These are separated by the fact that the heavy masses are different here. And this value down here, this is the, the, the finest ensemble at the heaviest mass, which is very close to the physical point. Uh, and I should just say quickly that you can see that the Z expansions here are very well behaved. Uh, they're linear, basically. Uh, we include quadratic terms, but to all intents and purposes, they're linear, as you can see from this. Final results for B to K. So it's at the, evaluated at the B mass in Q squared space. Um, and the thing to note, really take from this plot, is that the HQT expectation that F plus and F tensor are very similar or the same is uh, held out quite nicely here with these results. Now, this is, uh, as I say, at the B mass across Q squared. Because of our heavy HISC method, we can also evaluate at fixed Q squared points across the heavy mass range, which is what we've done here. Um, we've got Q squared naught and Q squared max for the three different form factors evaluated from the B all the way down to the D. So we've got B to K at this end, and we agree very nicely with these previous results here. We've got D to K at this end, where again, we agree with the results. Apart from this, um, the tensor form factor at Q squared max, and there's a tension there with ETMC. But this is the point of the heavy HISC approach is that we can then vary the heavy mass um, and we can have MB all the way down to MD. Uh, this is just a zoom in on that uh, tension with ETMC. It's about 3.1 3 sigma, something like that, I think, at this end. Um, and you can see our tensor seems to curve up a lot more than theirs does. Um, this is the DTK, and I should say these are preliminary results. Um, this is what we're seeing at the moment. So as with DTK, we want to get to the differential decay rate. In this case, we've got a much more complicated function. Have a look at this paper if you want to see it in its entirety. It's a function of the form factors and the Wilson coefficient, these Wilson coefficients. Uh, we can plug all this in, uh, turn the handle, and arrive with a differential decay rate. Uh, and this is what we plotted here. 
here's our um, differential branching fraction effect uh, in this blue band. Here are some previous experimental results. Uh, as has been seen previously, we are uh, considerably higher than these across most of the Q-squared range. Um, and we can integrate this to give a sort of one value for how much higher we are. That's this result here. Again, I should say all of this is preliminary. Um, we're over here considerably higher, particularly than these LHCB results down here, which are quite precise, significantly lower. And I should mention that the vetoed region um, contributes about 15% of this integral. Um, one final thing which has been discussed um, quite a lot in talks yesterday is this ratio, which is very clean theoretically. Um, this is the muon over electron ratio. And this there was this result last year, which is uh, three, three point something sigma from the standard model. Uh, we do have a new determination for this, um, but it will not contribute to that tension because the precision on the theoretical end is uh, much, much higher than experiment. This is, this is our point here with uncertainty on it. Uh, and you can see it really doesn't contribute. However, we will have a new result for this. Um, again, this is the preliminary result at the moment. Uh, so just to summarize, um, these are the new unitarity tests with our new VCS value. You can see that it still absolutely dominates the tests, but it's better than it was. Um, these are still consistent with one. Um, we've determined this value for VCS using bin by bin comparisons with experimental differ differential decay rate data. It's the first time it's been shown to be significantly less than one and the first time with a sub percentage uncertainty. Uh, we've tested this with three semi-independent methods that all agree nicely. Um, and the theory uncertainty is now at a similar level to the experimental uncertainty. And we have this, as I mentioned, this electromagnetic uncertainty, which is now quite large and needs some attention. Uh, we've done the first fully relativistic beta K form factor calculation. And the preliminary results are showing the same sort of tensions we've seen previously, uh, particularly though uh, very strong tensions with the LACB at the moment. Uh, so thank you for listening. Uh, has anyone got any questions? Thank you very much. Any questions and a comment? Yeah, Stefan. Yeah, just a quick question on the on the first line on your conclusion slide. So the, you have like the error of, on VCB, like is yes. only the last digit of, of, of this um, number. So does it make a difference yes. for you if you use exclusive or inclusive VCB here? Um, I don't think that would make a difference, no. This, yeah, as, I, as you say, that's only uh, a one in the, you know, in the level of... Right. No, I mean, just because the, the values differ significantly, so uh, so I would expect, like, that that would be reflected in a larger error, maybe, like... But, uh, um, I, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head, I'm afraid, which determination is used here. Um, I can have a look in that, though. That, that okay, thanks. thanks very um, much. Mm -hmm. Yes, that might make some difference, as you say. Thank you. Florian. Thanks. Very nice talk, Will. Um, I had a question regarding um, the electromagnetic error. Um, so yes. What strategies uh, do you think can be used to make that smaller? Um, so the main thing, so we've, we've looked at K to pi um, to, to motivate um, the, these choices here. This is, there's a bit more detail on this in the paper. Um, the DTK paper. So this is basically, you know, an estimate based on that. So I think what we need is a, a theory, a non-lattice theory calculation of the electromagnetic interactions uh, between the, the final state particles, um, which is not my area of expertise, but um, that's what's required here, I think. We could put charges in the, um, we could put charges into the lattice calculation, um, add QED effectively, and that would be a very small effect but that wouldn't um, contribute, I don't think, to these, these interactions between the k-on and the leptons. Thanks. Any more questions, comments? Lucia, yeah. Hi, yes, so, uh, thank you for the, for the talk. So um, I was wondering about uh, B2K uh, mu nu, uh, for example. Yes. Uh, do, if, if you have any, if you have had a look at that too, if there are any prospects. Uh, 
Um, yes, we have we have done that. I haven't shown that in here just because I didn't have time. Um, we are currently, as I say, this is still sort of uh, still under under uh, investigation. We're still working on it. But we have we have looked at that. Currently, we're quite similar to previous results. There's nothing. Our, our form factors, as you can see, are um, are um, they agree quite nicely with previous determinations. They're a little bit more precise in places. So. Um, yeah, we do have a new value for that, and that will come out. And I think the uncertainty at the moment is slightly better than previous, but um, it does, it's not shifted very far. Okay, and the Q square coverage, did, did, did you manage to get a wider uh, Q square range or still a high Q square? Yes, we have the full Q squared range for that. Okay, amazing. No, we have the full Q squared range for that. So, so yes, we have these, these are the form factors across the full Q squared range here. Um, and actually, we have we have much better uncertainties down it towards Q squared not actually than that Q squared max. But yes, yeah, so that everything will do will be available across the full Q squared range. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we have to move on. And many thanks to Will. And the next speaker is uh, Florian, and uh, the talk is about new results on the some leptonic B decay at bear two at bear. Yes. Thank you. The, uh, thank you for the uh, invitation. So uh, I'll jump right in because uh, Bell has been quite productive last year. And in total, I can cover six new um, or recent results. Uh, three of them are um, concerning inclusive decays and three of them exclusive decays. Um, and since that's quite a bit, <laughs> I'll, I'll start right away. Um, the first result um, that uh, uh, I'm going to talk about is uh, a new measurement of partial branch fractions of inclusive BTU or new decays for patronic tagging. And uh, the main motivation to study these decays is uh, also tensions in determinations of CKM matrix elements that involve um, B mesons. So um, here, VUB uh, using exclusive or inclusive methods. Um, there has been a long standing tension of about 3.3 sigma. Um, yeah. So these measurements, though, are typically quite uh, challenging uh, because uh, one has a, a lot of background from uh, B2C L new decays um, uh, that has to be suppressed. And typically, a clean separation of um, B2U L new and B2C L new is only possible um, in uh, extreme kinematic regions like the left one endpoint or low MX because a, a B2C transition cannot be uh, producing an MX that is uh, lower than a, a D meson, for instance. Okay. The analysis strategy used in this paper is um, to, of course, make use of the full Bell data set of 711 in Resemble Barn, and then use a method that has quite a low efficiency uh, called hadronic tagging, which uh, then uses neural networks to fully reconstruct one of those uh, two B mesons that we produce in uh, each of our uh, collision events uh, in hadronic modes. This uh, allows us to fully identify the hadronic system on the signal side. So uh, once you identify your tag site and the signal side lepton, you can look at the rest of the event um, but, and then take all uh, not associated uh, charge tracks and neutral clusters uh, to reconstruct the X system um, uh, on the signal side. And with that, you then have access to several kinematic variables. Um, uh, for instance, the form and transfer squared, the hadronic mass of the system, of course, and you can also reconstruct um, the, the neutrino mass, which uh, is denoted uh, typically in de facto experiments as missing mass squared, which should peak at zero for correct events. Then um, we use uh, general information about the event um, on the signal side to then suppress B2CL uh, new background. So one of those uh, uh, features, for instance, is missing mass squared that I just described. Um, since B2CL uh, is heavier, uh, you typically have a higher multiplicity and with that a poor resolution. So uh, you can exploit that to separate B2C only and B2U only. Other giveaways for a B2C transition is of course um, uh, a consecutive C to S transition where you uh, then can look for uh, charged or uh, uh, neutral kaons in the event. And all of that is put together into a, um, a, a machine learning method here, a, a boosted decision tree. And you can see at the bottom the output classifier um, that uh, uh, you then get. Okay, um, if you just do the selection before applying um, uh, this classifier, this is what you get. So here you see uh, a few of these kinematic variables that I described. Top left is the hadronic mass, top right, the formant and transfer squared uh, of the hadronic system. And on the bottom, you see the uh, um, lepton energy for two regions of MX that are either signal enriched or signal depleted. And you can see right away um, without doing something 
um, it's pretty much hopeless to measure your signal because it's this uh, small red sliver at the bottom. Um, after the T selection, uh, this changes quite drastically. So uh, you can now see actually signal <laughs> um, and this suppressed uh, a lot of the uh, B2C only background. Um, these distributions are then analyzed. Um, we uh, perform uh, uh, a kinematic fit and then unfold the partial branching fractions that we measure with this uh, in free phase space regions that are outlined here uh, with the most inclusive one um, covering uh, an EL, so a, a lepton energy value of larger than one GV. And at the bottom, you can see an example of uh, um, uh, such a fit. Uh, here, it's a 2D fit in MX and Q square. And uh, what you see here on the bottom left is uh, a Q squares level in a, in a given uh, MX region on the right-hand side, the projection of MX uh, of all Q squared um, um, bins. Using that, uh, we can then uh, measure the partial um, branching fraction and then use uh, theory calculations to extract uh, VUB from it. Um, this has been done in the paper with the, the four available calculations. Um, you can see them here in blue. Uh, and we also provide uh, an arithmetic average that is just simply averaging these um, uh, four values. Uh, and that we then also compare with, for instance, the uh, exclusive. Uh, P2 uh, pi on the UB value or the value from CCAM unitarity. And there we get tensions of about 1.3 and 1.6 sigma respectively. Uh, the result is also fairly stable. Um, the PDT itself uh, suppressed a lot of the only background, but we also tested what happens if we allow more or less background in and the partial branching fraction um, yeah, stays uh, nearly the same. Okay, this brings me to the next uh, of the, the results. Um, it's uh, a very similar analysis, but now targeting differential branching fractions, not partial ones. And the, uh, the goal of the analysis is to measure six kinematic variables that characterize BTUL new transitions and unfold them in the uh, uh, lepton energy larger than one GV region of phase space. And the selection and um, is uh, identical to the partial branching fraction measurement that I show you with some additional cuts to improve the resolution. What you see at the bottom here are the six variables that were studied. Um, so it's is, uh, the hadronic mass, uh, MX, hadronic mass squared, Q squared, the uh, lepton energy, and uh, two light cone momenta, P plus and P minus of the uh, hadronic system. And what you see here is already background subtracted, and the background subtraction is done via coarse fit in, uh, in MX. And then this fixes the background, and then we subtract um, uh, the background components. Um, the measure distributions, though, are quite heavily affected by um, uh, the reconstruction. So uh, if you can think of this like that a true distribution is mangled by the detector response. Um, and so we have to um, uh, undo this effect. This is done via uh, so-called unfolding. Um, and in the simplest version of doing this, you can just basically use the um, uh, response matrix of the detector and invert it. Um, we use uh, a slightly smarter version here um, called singular value decomposition that uh, also introduces some mild regularization. Okay, um, this is the final result. So you can see here the differential spectra um, now corrected also for acceptance effects and unfolded for um, the phase space region of EL larger than 1 GV. Um, you see them compared here also to um, three different um, uh, theory calculations or models. So in blue, on, these are the dashed histograms here. And um, overall, the agreement uh, in the different variables is uh, rather um, uh, well. Um, one can see some um, by I some potential uh, tension in EL, but the bins in question here are actually quite highly anti-correlated uh, due to the background subtraction. Uh, we did also some chi-square tests. Um, you see the values here at the bottom right, and overall, um, uh, the, the models and the theory calculations agree quite well with the measured spectrum. Okay, um, we also determined the full experimental correlations of all these spectra um, amongst themselves, since they uh, analyze the same events, uh, they're correlated. Um, so you can actually um, fully analyze all of those projections at the same time using this uh, correlation matrix here. And uh, the idea is, of course, that this is an uh, interesting input for future um, more shape function independent determinations of UP that go beyond the uh, four QCD calculations I mentioned. And uh, here are two poster childs for that. So uh, NNVUB from Capino, Haley Montino et al., um, and Simba um, from uh, me and uh, some colleagues. Okay. Then um, the uh, last inclusive one is uh, measurements of Q square moments for inclusive P to C on UTKs. So now we're looking at the background of what we just looked at before. Um, so here the motivation is, of course, to uh, find new ways to uh, measure inclusive ECP. Typically, this is done using the uh, operator product expansion um, of the inclusive rate. And um, that then expresses basically the decay rate in, a, in terms of non-perturbative matrix elements that have to be determined experimentally. 
And one problem one faces is if one goes higher and higher in this expansion to achieve more sensitivity or more um, uh, precision, uh, the number of those terms just uh, explode. And there has been a fresh idea um, by these three theorists, uh, Matteo uh, Feil, uh, Thomas Mannel, and Kelly Foss, um, and that pointed out that depending on what uh, distribution you look at, actually the number of these non perturbative matrix elements um, uh, do not necessarily have to explode. So if you uh, would measure um, the, the Q-square moments instead of the typical MX moments or EL moments, um, you actually get less of those additional matrix elements. So um, in the case of uh, um, uh, MX versus Q-square, for instance, you reduce them from 13 new one at order one over MB to the four to only eight. Okay. But no one has measured these Q-square moments. Um, so we uh, bell uh, then uh, uh, went about that. And the key technique is very similar to the PTU only analysis. So we use hadronic tagging so we can identify the hadronic X system and then calculate from that uh, Q-square. And then also uh, I'm, I'm, I'm able to do a background subtraction in MX. So you can see the, the two distributions um, um, after the selection on the right-hand side. Um, and you see that it's basically P2C only dominated already with other backgrounds also there. This one subtle thing uh, one wants to measure is with uh, uh, the lowest possible uh, lepton momentum selection because uh, only then one is uh, very inclusive in, in Q square. Okay, the moments then are determined in four steps. Uh, step one is you subtract the background. Um, this is done by fitting MX and then um, uh, providing some unbind um, uh, signal probability as a function of Q square. Then you have to uh, again undo what the detector does. So you can calibrate, you need to calibrate the measured moments. Um, and this is done by exploiting a linear dependence between the reconstructed and true moment, moments. Um, then step three, this however doesn't work perfectly. So uh, if you fail, you have to try again. So there's a small, small bias that one wants to correct because they're almost linear, but just really linear. But that's a very small correction of uh, less than a percent. And then the last step is you have to correct for selection effects since you uh, reconstructed uh, things with hadronic tagging, and that gives you an additional bias of one to two percent of those moments. And okay. here's what is measured. Um, the uh, yeah, so you can see here on the left-hand side the uh, Q-square moment, um, so the first-order moment, um, and on the right-hand side the fourth-order moment with uh, progressive cuts on Q-square itself, and also compared to the um, uh, prediction of the uh, sorry, this should be XC cocktail, um, and we also checked. Um, uh, the ratios between electrons and muons um, to be measured I mean, individually, so one can do also a LFU test. Okay, then uh, it's time to go on to exclusive results from Bell. So the first is uh, measurements of um, um, bandwidth fractions of P2 pi pi only. Um, the analysis uh, is also using um, hadronic tagging with neural networks um, as an analysis strategy, uh, and then reconstruct the signal side with just a lepton and two charged pions. And then one can also reconstruct, of course, the neutrino uh, form momentum using the, uh, the formula here for premise. Then uh, background has to be suppressed. So there's a lot of background from P2D only. Um, uh, and that can be done by uh, using a BTT that employs six features. And then we can basically uh, bin up in whatever variables we want to study um, um, the data and then fit missing mass square. Uh, to subtract signal and background. This is shown here at the bottom um, in three bins of uh, the invariant pi pi mass, um, uh, where you can then see here missing mass square, and the red histogram is signal, and the other histograms um, are correspond to the, the background, so it should be separated. On the left here, so you also see the, the BBT for the background suppression. Then uh, this is, uh, the result is actually quite nice because it's for the first time a fully differential measurement of beta pi pi l nu that includes resonant and non resonant parts. Typically, if one measures beta pi pi l nu, one just focuses on the row. Um, and uh, the measurement has been done as a function of m pi pi, q square, and also in two dimensions in m pi pi and q square. It's uh, systematically dominated at the time being due to the signal modeling uncertainties um, because one has to then somehow put together a cocktail of non resonant and resonant uh, decays to get the efficiencies. And uh, you can see here, uh, though, quite nicely, um, there is some excess over the P2R well new um, uh, branching fraction alone. So um, the bottom result is the new one uh, in the Bell paper. And you can also see here, if you look at the projections, uh, on the left, you see MPI pi, you see nicely a row peak, and um, but also a, a hint for the F2. Um, and the Q-square spectrum is on the right-hand side. OK, then um, the next result is an exclusive uh, new measurement of the branching fraction of P2 eta and eta prime L new using the full Q-square range. Um, this also uses the full data set, um, uh, but this time without tagging. So one only reconstructs the signal side and reconstructs the edas in uh, these two modes and the eta prime uh, in uh, the, uh, that mode here with uh, two charged pions and an eta. And the eta here then goes into uh, gamma gamma. 
Um, the suppressed background, uh, also two PDTs are used, um, and uh, one then focuses on the events that are um, in a cos theta uh, B eta L range, smaller than one. And this is a nice variable because it can be fully um, uh, measured with just uh, uh, all the uh, visible particles in the final state. At the bottom, you see um, the two fit variables, uh, MBC and delta E. Um, uh, and uh, here, the green sliver is basically the signal that is extracted. And uh, yeah, the measure branching fractions are um, here at the bottom. So for B2, uh, et al mu, yeah, something like 2.8 times 10 to the minus 5, and for eta prime also about 2.8. And then the last result um, uh, is a uh, 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 LFU test uh, involving uh, omega L nu decays, um, also using uh, the full Bell data set. Uh, this time, uh, since we are focusing on uh, uh, omega Cs that are produced in uh, CC bar production, you can actually use the full full Bell data set that involves the on resonance and off resonance data and the scan data. Um, so you have more than 711 in your um, The signal is then extracted uh, by fitting the uh, omega L mass distribution, and it's normalized to omega C to omega pi. And this has been actually uh, in this paper the first observation of the um, semi-leptonic decays of um, um, this kind with muons in the final state. At the bottom here, you can see the um, normalization mode on the left-hand side, and then the uh, omega E, uh, omega mu masses. Um, and um, yeah, uh, the various backgrounds, which are determined from uh, looking at sidebands um, in, in the uh, uh, mass distribution of the omega itself. The ratio itself is compatible with unity and close to the um, uh, prediction of uh, this theory paper. Um, yeah, so no surprises here. This brings me to my summary. Um, yeah, so semi-leptonic PDKs are cute, but that might be deceiving because they <laughs> give us for quite a long time <laughs> quite some headache uh, in terms of uh, measuring VUB and VCB. Um, there has been a long-standing tension, which is currently about 3.3 sigma between um, those two values, which uh, impede our um, capabilities to uh, do a unitarity triangle tests. Um, and uh, yeah, so Bell has been very active, and I showed you six results. So um, um, one of the highlights here is that the discrepancy between exclusive and inclusive UB is reduced with the uh, latest branching fraction measurement from Bell. It's now only 1.3 sigma. Um, the uh, first systematic measurements of differential B2U only um, branching fraction have been uh, done last year, uh, which will pave the way for more model independent UB determinations. Uh, Bell measured um, the B2C only Q square moments for the first time, which provide a new observable um, and can be included also in existing uh, inclusive VCB fits. Uh, we had the first measurement of beta pi pi only mass distributions, which are interesting, and that's a potential new uh, channel for exclusive uh, UB if we can get uh, lattice predictions for beta pi pi only at some point. And uh, yeah, the last results uh, are new measurements of beta eta and eta prime only and um, the omega c to omega l new seven epsilon case. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Questions and comments. Yes, Martin. <clears throat> yeah, hi. Hi. Um, um, I, I, I think you were just a bit too fast for me on, on slide 22. So I did not get what this systematic effect is where all the uh, uh, individual points are above the predicted line. So, 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 so you have this prediction and all points are above this prediction. So what, what is this? So the, uh, maybe it's better visible here in the ratio. So the, um, the prediction itself, of course, also has uncertainties, right? So um, right. Ah, yeah. Okay. So it's the, uh, not visible on my screen, actually. Yes. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah, so they, okay. they kind of touch. But it's true that the data um, moments are slightly higher. Um, yeah. Systematically, right? Systematically, so, yeah. Right. So, so what's entering the prediction? I mean, is, these are these are not the normalized moments, right? So there's VCB entering in these uh, predictions? No, um, so VCB is not entering into predictions, but the uh, composition um, uh, of how you model your B2CL new enters. So these are not inclusive predictions, um, or uh, this is from a uh, B2XCL new cocktail based on uh, adding B2D, D star, B2D double star, the gap, um, and ah, then right. also making branching okay. fraction variations. Right. Um, and one thing that also should be noted is these points here are quite highly correlated. <laughs> so it, it might look like sure. weird. So, um, but for instance, these measurement points here are uh, something like 98% uh, correlated if you look at just neighboring ones. So, um, sure. so it, yeah, it looks worse than uh, it is if you just make a chi-square. Yeah. I see. Um, 
So is this then related to the inclusive exclusive discrepancy? Uh, like that the sum doesn't reflect the inclusive, but, but you correct for that in your simulation, right? I think. Yeah, yeah. And we, we do quite um, drastic variations in the measurements themselves. So um, mm -hmm. one of the largest uncertainty actually of the measurement is the scale of Q square. Um, um, and there uh, we, we saw that uh, if there's a small bias in the Q square reconstruction, that uh, would give you an offset um, of a, um, a half a percent between the um, the actual reconstructed and um, um, and the uh, potentially reconstructed uh, Q square value uh, without changing the true value, uh, you can induce quite large uncertainties. So this is basically the dominating effect here that um, the, the Q square scale uncertainty and the reconstruction. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have to stop here and uh, thank you, Florian. And the next speaker is Marcus. And the, the talk is about hydronic B decays at bell two. Uh, hello. Yes, I can share your screen. Yes. Okay, can I start? Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, hello, I'm going to present you a few recent results of Bell and Bell 2 actually in the sector of hadronic PDKs. Um, hadronic PDKs means um, B2 charmed or B2 charmless decay. So either we have a charm quark in the final states or we don't have a charm quark in the final states. Um, charmed decays are so um, B2D or D star plus a light hadron where the light hadron is a kaon or a pion. Um, for this, we have to transform a B to a C quark, uh, which can happen on tree level and is Kabibo favored. So therefore, these decays come with high branching fractions. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, they're very clean. So they can be used um, to test standard model predictions. And because of this high branching fraction, they are often used as control modes in, in other decays. For example, in these charmless decays, we often use them as control modes to validate our analysis. Also in B2 DK decays, we can um, determine the CKM angle gamma of I3. Charmless decays on the other hand are B2 light hadrons, so kaons or pions. Here we have to transform a B2AU quark, uh, which can happen on tree level, but it's Kabibo suppressed, or uh, on loop level transform a B2 a D or S. Um, because of this uh, Kabibo suppression on tree level, these loop contributions are the dominating ones in those decays, which makes them very interesting because in these loops we can uh, have new physics effects entering, so we should be sensitive to measure those. Also, we can uh, contribute to the determination of all of those, um, to all of the CKM angles because we can have any quark transition here. Um, the challenges uh, in these charmless channels are that they come with very small uh, branching fractions and we have uh, high backgrounds. Uh, the main background is what we call continuum. It's where we do not produce a pair of B mesons in E plus E minus collisions, but produce a pair of, pair of uh, Q, Q bar um, where the Q is, is a light quark, so U, D, C or S. Uh, this slide shows an overview of how we do analysis in those channels. Um, we start by reconstruction. This means that we're looking for our final states of interest, so pines and kaons, and combine them in kinematic fits to form our B. Um, when we have BD, uh, B candidates, then we optimize our selection. So in this step, we want to um, get rid of as much background as possible uh, while retaining as much signal as possible. So this is mainly continuum suppression, which is done uh, using boosted decision trees, uh, which then have some distinction power between uh, continuum and signal events, um, or we impose cuts on the particle IDs of these uh, pines and cairns. Sometimes we have to remove uh, peaking backgrounds uh, so when our resonance interferes with our signal, we can veto those uh, and then we can determine our selection efficiency. So how much of our signal actually survives our selection, which we then need to calculate branching fractions. Uh, the third step is to fit the sample that we have in the end. 
For this, we use um, observables that have nice distinction power between signal and background. Typical ones in these B experiments are delta E, which is shown here, uh, which is the difference between the reconstructed energy of the beam uh, of the B and half of the beam energy, and MBC, which is the beam constraint mass. And it's basically the reconstructed mass of the B, but instead of using the energy of the B, we use uh, half of the beam energy, which is more precisely known. And you can see that this has nice distinction power between Q cube I events or continuum events, which are flat, and actual PV by events, which peak at the B mass. And delta E has distinction power between actual signal events and some other BB bar um, decays, for example, where we might have misidentified a pion as a K on, which is then slightly shifted. And the last step is to calculate our systematic uncertainties. Okay, then let's start with the actual first analysis. This is a combined measurement uh, of Bell and Bell 2. In the Bell 2 uh, software, we have the possibility to import Bell data, and then we can do these combined uh, analyses. This is about a measurement of the CKM angle phi 3 from B to DK decays. So this CKM angle, gamma of phi 3, is the phase between B2C and B2U transitions, which are present in B to DK decays. Can have two paths. Uh, one is the favorite one, it's B to D0, K. Here you have a B to C transition and a suppressed one, it's B to D0 bar, K, where you have a B to U transition, which is uh, color and Kabibo suppressed. And if you now reconstruct, reconstruct both of those decays from a common final state, here the Ds are reconstructed from K short pi pi and K short KK, then you get access to, to this phase. So you can take the, the ratio between the amplitudes, uh, between the suppressed and the favorite mode. And this is given by this expression here, where you have the CKM, ang CKM angle, the strong phase, and the magnitude between the two of them. Um, then you have to properly describe your DDK. As I said, we're reconstructing the Ds from K short pi pi and K short KK. So this is a three body decay. So you have a Dalitz plot. Um, you could describe your Dalitz plot with a model that you develop, but this comes with a large systematic uncertainties. So what is done in this analysis is a model independent approach. And this is done, or this is achieved by binning the Dalitz plot. And then to, to be able to do this, you need the strong faces in each of the bins of the D. And this is this comes from external measurements, Clio MBS3. So you get rid of the model by binning and then using strong phase measurements uh, from Clio MBS3. The binning schemes that are chosen, you can see here for K short pi pi and K short KK. And they are chosen such that they maximize the statistical sensitivity. And then you can relate the yields in each bin to these uh, physics parameters that we want to measure. Um, so how are actually the yields extracted? Um, this is done in a two-dimensional fit in delta E and C prime. C prime is this um, boosted decision to use to um, suppress continuum or, or a transform of that. That's why we have a prime. Then it's a simultaneous fit in a K on enhanced sample and in a pi on enhanced sample. This has the advantage then you can uh, extract or that the fit can extract the k pi misidentification rate um, directly on data. Uh, you can see this here. Um, this is the delta E distribution of B to DK, where you have the signal peak and you also have a large peak, which are actually um, B to D pi decays, a B to D pi decays where the pion was misidentified as a k on. So you split the two samples by having a requirement on the binary um, k on likelihood. Um, to be smaller 0.6, then this is pi on enhanced, and to be larger than 0.6, then this is k on enhanced, and then you fit them simultaneously. Um, this is the result that is reported in this um, in this paper, which was just accepted by JHAP. It's about 78 uh, degree, 11 degree statistical uncertainty, 0.5 systematic uncertainty, and 1.0 external inputs. These are these Clio and PES3 strong phase inputs. Um, there was an earlier measurement from Bell from 2012. It's compatible with this one, but here we have uh, in this new one, the, all the systematic uncertainties are heavily reduced, um, which is uh, because of this, these reasons that I'm listing here. So we have better K-short reconstruction, better background rejection. We have now this 
kion and pion enhanced simultaneous fit. Um, we're now also including the strong phases from best three before it was just clear, and we have more data. Overall, this is the most precise measurement from any B factory, and it's the first time that we did this combined measurement of Bell and Bell 2 data. Uh, the next analysis is a Bell analysis on the full data set. It's B2D8. And these modes are interesting because they can be used to test QCD factorization predictions. One uh, quantity is particularly interesting are these ratios between B2 d pi and B2 dk branching fractions. Uh, the nice thing is that here you cancel out a lot of systematic effects that you have present in both, uh, in both of those modes. There is this ratio from what on from 2020, <clears throat> which compares QCD factorization predictions. So there are predictions with what we actually have in the PDG. And they observe quite heavy tensions in the, the branching fractions up to five sigma in the B2DK uh, channel. Um, what is very interesting is that the, the, the ratios between those um, branching fractions coincides well. So you only have the tensions in the branching fractions, but not in these ratios. Um, they also provide a, a list of uh, possible explanations for why we have this, these tensions here. Uh, I hope that it's not an experimental issue. Uh, the coolest, of course, would be if it's actually new physics that we need to explain that. So um, in this analysis, the Ds are reconstructed from, K on, from a K on and two pions, and then the, the yields are extracted in a similar way to the one that I just showed you, but it's just a fit in delta E, but again in a K on and in a pion enhanced sample. Uh, the results uh, are in this paper, which was accepted by PRD. Uh, these are the results for the R ratio and the branching fraction of B2DK and B2D pi. This measurement alone of the branching fraction has a tension of 6.6 .6 sigma to, to the theory paper that I just showed you. Five minutes. Okay, thanks. Um, the next analysis that I want to show you is uh, again a Bell analysis on the channel B2D star H uh, on the full data set. This is still preliminary and it's the first time that this is shown. Um, here you have to reconstruct the D star. This is always done by combining a D zero with a pion. And then the D zero is reconstructed from either a K on and a pion or a K on three pions. Um, here you have some background from misreconstructed D stars because you have a lot of tracks that go into your D star. So you, you might pick up a wrong one. And this is, you can then see in this pinkish band here, um, which are misreconstructed D stars. The fitting strategy is similar to the one before. You have, again, a simultaneous fit in a kaon and a pion enhanced sample. Um, these are the results uh, individually for the two channels used to reconstruct the D star and if you combine both of them. Uh, this is compared to two theory predictions. The one in brackets is the one from the Bordon paper. And then there's another one. Um, and you can see that there are slight tensions between theory and uh, the, the, this measurement. Overall, this result is, the results are compatible with an earlier band measurement with improved uh, answer, uh, sensitivity. Um, this analysis also provides a measurement of this R ratio, again, individually for the two channels used to reconstruct the D. And if you combine both of them, and also here, there are some tensions um, to, to theory. You can also see this in this plot uh, where you have two theory predictions in this, this band. Then you have a measurement from Baba, one from LHCB, and the three measurements from, from this Bell analysis. You can see that all the central values uh, of the measurements are shifted to the right compared to uh, the prediction. However, the Baba and LHCB measurement is still compatible. And now here in this Bell analysis, we get uh, some tensions, slight tensions, I would say. In this uh, analysis, the experimental uncertainty is 3.2%, which is a bit smaller than the one from LHCB and BABA, but it's not a one-by-one -one comparison because LHCB used a different channel and BABA didn't do this simultaneous fit of K and Pi and enhanced sample. Uh, the last analysis that I want to show you is a Bell analysis or a Bell 2 analysis on, on an early data set, uh, and it's a charmless channel. It's B0 to K0 Pi0. In this um, B2K pi decays, there exists a relation called isospin sum rule, which is 
basically a clever combination of all the branching fractions of the four channels and their direct CP violation parameters. And according to standard model, this should be a very small value. So by measuring all of those quantities, we can have an experimental value and then compare it. So we can test the standard model. What is nice for, for Bell and Bell 2 is that this is limited uh, by the uncertainties on the K0 pi 0 channel. Because uh, at the moment, we think we're the only experiment who can do this. This is also shown in this plot. Uh, this is the the sensitivity on uncertainty and how this will develop over time if we do not have input from Bell 2. So if we only update the other channels or if we uh, also update uh, K0 pi 0 with Bell 2 measurements. Uh, we reported our first measurement on branching fraction ACP last year Morion. This is the result. Um, and at the moment we're working on an update on, on this measurement and we will include um, a measurement of time dependent CP violation. Uh, this is my summary. I, I showed you a few Bell results. So Bell is still there and putting out great physics uh, measurements. Now Bell 2 is joining and we expect to be world leading in the charmless sector uh, with neutral final states only in about one year. This is the luminosity projection and in about one year we expect to have the same data set as Bell and then we will we'll be world leading in these uh, charmless channels with usual final states only. Also, we can improve on the CKM angle phi 3, but for this, we need a lot more data. So this on the longer scale. And I showed you that it's possible um, to combine Bell and Bell 2 data sets, um, which gives nice possibilities for future analysis. So yeah, we, we are working on, on new, new results and updates, which will come soon. So stay tuned and thank you. Thank you very much. Questions and comments? I think Niels, yeah, Martin, actually. Okay, Niels, please. Hi, many thanks for this nice talk. Uh, I, I just wanted to make a remark on your slide 10, where you, uh, where you look at the, the, the branching ratio, ratio of dk over d pi. Um, and, and one of the possibilities you say, you, you comment on that maybe experimental results make these branching ratios uh, deviate. But I just wanted to, to remark here that this ratio uh, is, is an extremely good agreement with the LHCB. And I think I just looked it up and I, I think our value was 0 .00, sorry, 0 0.0822. Um, so of course, uh, experimental problems might cancel in the ratio, but, but nevertheless, I wanted to stress that the Bell and LHCB results on this ratio are, are an excellent agreement. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yes, thanks. Uh, I agree there was this talk yesterday from Alexander Lenz. Uh, he also... Um, commented on this and he had a, um, I think a post on, on Twitter um, reporting on this, um, this deviation and he asked um, what he think or what people think why this is. And I think 90% uh, said that this might be a QCD factorization problem. And I think 0% were thinking that this is an actual experimental problem. So yes, uh, all the measurements agree very well. Any more questions, comments? Okay, if no, let's thank Max again. And uh, we move to the next talk. Next talk will be the measure of the CP violating phase in B baryon decays by Rock yeah, I hope uh, you can see my slides. Uh, uh, yes. So please unmute yourself. We cannot hear you. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. So okay. yesterday we had this uh, very nice talk by our chairman um, on uh, observing CP violation. Uh, today I'm going to talk about measuring CP violating phase in beauty baryon decays because 
uh, it is more likely that we see um, uh, uh, first uh, CP violation in beauty meson, beauty baryons. Uh, this work is done uh, in collaboration with Shibashi Roy and Andy Deshpande. And uh, uh, just a minute, uh, gosh, how do I get to the next slide? Ah, no, 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 one minute. It is, yeah, okay. Uh, so the first question arises, which was already addressed yesterday, was why measure CP violation in baryons? One of the outstanding problems in physics is to explain the baryon antibaryon asymmetries on uh, of nature, which requires CP violation. Uh, for the Sakharov condition to hold, uh, at least in the standard model, since we have seen CP violation in mesons, CP violation should also be seen in baryons. Even though the earliest proposal to measure CP violation uh, was made by Okubo in 1957 for baryons, uh, much before the CP violation observed in K, CP violation has not yet been observed in baryons. But we have to go a step further. We must measure the CP phases in baryon decays and compare it with those measured in mesons to test the standard model. Any disagreement uh, would of course point to new physics. So, um, the largest CP phase should be expected in anti triplet three bar B baryons. And uh, now we have seen, uh, we have done clean measurements as pointed out in B mesons, but not in K and D. And no reason why you should expect clean measurements of weak phases in baryons. And indeed, we worked on this problem for several years. And after many failures, we were almost thinking it's going to be a no stop, uh, no go theorem. And uh, uh, However, um, we stumbled upon a mode that I'm going to talk about today. It's important to realize what are the important issues in trying to measure uh, a CP violating phase in baryons. There are many hurdles. Of course, in order to measure CP violating phase, one knows that you know, certain conditions have been satisfied. We, uh, it's well known that CP violation is observed only via amplitudes with two contributing contributions uh, with different strong phase and different weak phase that is interference. In neutral B mesons, mixing between particle and antiparticle allows for uh, such an interference, which is well-known time-dependent mixing. In baryon, of course, baryon number conservation orbits uh, uh, oscillations between baryon and antibaryons, disallowing uh, such interference of two amplitudes. Uh, in addition to this, there is another uh, important thing which is less uh, emphasized in literature. That is, at least one of the decay amplitudes, we reparameterize this invariant such that the CP volatile phase to be measured can uniquely define. I just spend a few minutes on uh, this issue because what happens in Bezon is that you have the uh, two magnitudes of the amplitudes. Is my cursor visible? Okay, uh, for the mode and conjugate mode, but you also have a measurement of, of the angle between the Z1, Z1 bar. And that fixes things. So all I can write my amplitude is A1 plus B1 e to the power I pi. And for the conjugate mode, I have B1 e to the power minus I pi. However, that still does not define pi because I could have chosen a different A1 and different B1 because A1 and B1 are also unknown. Okay, so in order to define my phi clearly, I must have knowledge of A1 or B1. And that means that weak phase cannot be measured unless I can somehow from some other mode estimate A1 or B1. And all our measurements of, uh, for example, alpha or beta, this is resolved in a simple way where, you know, in, in alpha, you already have an eigenstate, no pollution. So it's just one quantity. In phi on, you isolate the T plus C by doing the, the charge mode. However, in baryons, you don't have uh, the interference term between Z1, Z1 bar star. So what happens is that you cannot, in fact, define pi at all um, because I could have chosen, for example, this configuration where the angle between the Z1 and Z1 bar was this, or I could have chosen any other angle here and you, I could have chosen different A's and different pi's. And so you see, I have no way of doing things. However, if I have both my A and B fixed and my magnitudes of this fixed, 
say Z1, Z1 bar, which I have measured, then I can, in fact, define the phase. And therefore, measurement of weak phases in baryon is a step more complicated because you need to get both the amplitudes in uh, A and B. Inability to satisfy uh, this condition results in fewer independent observables than necessary to measure weak phases. And a clean measurements of alpha, beta, and B mesons satisfy these conditions. Of course, time-dependent mixing is not always done. For example, in the measurement of gamma, we don't do it. We could you charge mode and measure gamma, where there is no Z1, Z1 bar star term. And that is done because you can get the interference through the CPI uh, mode, and then you can measure D and D bar mode separately to get A1 and B1. So you do satisfy pre-parameterization in order to do this. In baryons, what we found for years was that we are unable to come up with a mode where we could do things. This does not mean that in baryons, we will not observe CP violation in, in, in B. However, it will not be possible to do a clean measurement. So we focus on a mode, which is chi B minus going to sigma prime zero pi minus or uh, sigma prime minus pi zero, which decays finally to the common uh, mode lambda zero pi minus pi zero. And the chi prime is uh, uh, duplicates JP three half uh, baryon with symmetric, sorry, with symmetric, uh, uh, I'm going to just use my mouse, yeah. Okay, yeah. So what happens is that the sigma prime zero decays to lambda zero pi zero and sigma, pi, uh, uh, sigma prime minus decays to lambda zero pi zero and the mass of the sigma prime are like oops, M and gamma. Uh, and why do we choose this mode? Because as I said, we cannot, we found that nothing but due to reparameterization invariance. Uh, if, if I'm looking at the delta is equal to zero mode. So, because we didn't want the electric penguin contribution and this mode is very nice because it has just two contributions, the penguin contribution. And that is essentially ensured because the three bar has an anti-symmetric uh, uh, three bar baryon. And the final uh, baryon here is a symmetric baryon. And therefore, only the P and C contributions come, but the P only contributes to uh, sigma, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, only P diagram contributes to sigma minus pi zero, whereas both C and P contribute to sigma prime zero pi minus. And due to the absence of the uptype quark, uh, there is no uh, final, uh, in the final state, there is no, it's in the initial state, sorry, uh, there is no exchange diagram which exists. Now, the CP violating phase measured in our approach is based on only on experimental uh, measured observables and hence free from any hadronic uncertainty. We'll make uh, only very reliable theoretical assumptions. One is isospin uh, with two pions, and then there is a vanishingly small electric pen contributions in the delta is equal to zero B to D transitions. Okay, and uh, as I said, there are two intermediate states possible if I'm looking at lambda zero pi, zero pi minus. One is the sigma minus, uh, sigma prime minus, and the other is sigma prime zero. And uh, there's the U channel and the T channel because I have the Q1 and Q2 and Q1 and Q3 here. And we work in the Jackson Gottfried uh, Jackson frame where this angle theta defines the angle between the pi minus and the lambda. Okay. Now, if I look at the Dallas plot in terms of, I can define my Mandelstam variables as T u and in terms of this angle theta, and here are the two resonance uh, that could appear if I were not to bother with uh, any isospin effects. Clearly, in this case, you see that the uh, two sigma prime resonance is sigma prime zero and sigma minus don't interfere. And therefore, why would we bother with the uh, one body period and naively think, why should I bother with the further decay? And uh, there is no use. Um, I can't create interference using these. However, there's an important thing that happens because of both symmetry between the two pions. So our new method to measure CP violating phase uh, using interference uh, arises implicitly due to both symmetric considerations of the decaying amplitude. 
if pi minus pi zero in the final state uh, can either be in a one minus one state or a two minus one isospin state. And since the two pions are identical bosons under isospin, uh, the total wave function must be symmetric. That is, the odd isospin one minus one state must be anti-symmetric under special exchange, and even isospin two one state must be symmetric under special exchange. And special exchange here is the t to u or theta to pi minus theta for the Dallas plot pi zero going to pi minus. And since the chi b minus is an isospin half, isolating the symmetric state, which is the uh, two minus one state is equivalent to isos uh, isolating the isospin three half contribution, which cannot arise from the penguin diagram. And that allows us to get a pure CP eigenstate and uh, what is important to realize is that both symmetric considerations require that both decays should not be considered in isolation, but together in terms of even and odd contributions um, to, uh, okay. I'm sorry, one minute, one minute, what did I go? Huh. Yeah, so a little bit of detail. Um, we have the chi b uh, decaying to a sigma prime pi, where the sigma prime is a spin three half uh, baryon, therefore the radiator Schwinger spinner, and the A wave and P wave, uh, uh, P wave and D wave contributions labeled by A and B are complications that arise in uh, baryons. You always have partial waves. The couplings are defined here. I don't want to get into detail. These uh, there's a complicated propagator because of the spinner three half, and you have the matrix element for the um, U channel, which comes from the sigma minus, and the T channel, which comes from the sigma prime zero. And uh, the P wave and D wave contributions, which are given here, the A zero, are simply given by this, where P wave and D were exactly, uh, this is the C and P contributions, uh, the, Topology diagram on P wave and D wave. And I have written this after rotation of the uh, phase of E to the minus i gamma, but it doesn't change anything. Now, the both symmetric combination of the matrix element. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, five minutes. Yeah. Ah, okay. The both symmetric combination of the matrix element can be written in terms of the even contributions, which is the sum of A, e, uh, A minus and A zero. And the odd contribution is the difference. And we add and subtract the two contributions to the matrix elements here. And the two contributions then can be written in terms of the topological diagrams as this. And just for simplicity of notation and for solutions, I can just say that you know we have defined these new variables xp and yp. And our aim is to determine the complex amplitudes a e a o b e b o using dialect plot distributions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So uh, the correlation plots that uh, the Dallas in terms of s hat and theta, which I had already pointed out in the previous thing where I defined the Maltesian variables, would look something like this if I choose make a choice of parameters. And uh, what we have done is we have plotted the logarithmic values of the p wave rates here in terms of the scaled uh, Maltesian variable s, and the effects of CP values are indicated by differences in the two Dallas plots. So we have chosen, of course, a, a phase of pi by two here, just for demonstration simplicity. The difference between the sigma, uh, uh, the sigma prime minus and the sigma prime uh, bar plus is um, a smoking and evidence of large Bose correlations, because if I were not to take Bose correlations, then of course, this is a pure uh, mode, and there would be no difference between this and that. It is the Bose correlation that causes the CP violation and the difference between these two modes. Without Bose correlation, this would look, these two modes would look identical. Okay, so both uh, correlations play a fundamental role in our new approach to measure CP uh, phases. Okay, now if I look at the numerator of the decay rate, then after working out from the matrix element, it looks something like this in terms of the angle theta. Uh, where uh, all masses of momentum are normalized to S. And uh, these are 
coefficients of the even and odd part, and at the these are the coefficients of the interference terms, which involve the real and imaginary parts of the AE and B. AE is a, a, a B wave, and the D wave contributions are the D uh, are the B. Um, for any given choice of S, FIN, and GIN, and just numbers, we drop explicit S hat and uh, we fit the function to solve for this. So, in terms of this, you can solve for this if you have minimum of eight uh, bins of data, including both the sides of the resonance for mode and exactly the same for conjugate mode. Okay. So, the solutions are, of course, very simple and uh, you can solve this in terms of this and you get the solution for the weak phase in terms of clear uh, uh, differences between this mode or in terms of a direct CP asymmetry between the odd mode, okay? And R6, which is the boundary part of this. And you have all the other uh, amplitudes also solved. There are more observables here and there are constraints, of course, that will enable you to a better solution. There is, of course, identical solution for the D wave, and so you actually will be able to measure um, alpha in the P wave and D wave separately. And the separation is done automatically because we have just shown that, you know, you can do the P wave and D wave separations completely by doing the eight bin analysis in the Dallas plot. That is, if you do total this plus this eight bins, both the resonances, eight bins. Okay. Now, of course, in reality, the Dallas plot is much more complicated. There are other resonances which will complicate the things. For example, uh, just as a sample uh, for a different set of values, I've shown how lambda zero rho minus uh, will contribute. However, uh, you know, these are not difficult uh, to isolate. Dallas plot in principle has enough information to separate such effects. And this has only, it contributes only to the odd part is an S and extra bins will be, will enable us to resolve all the resonance contributions, and of course, one will put appropriate cuts on uh, things to get the dominant resonance. So this will be part of an upcoming paper. And uh, another uh, thing we, uh, we are uh, writing up is that uh, we could do the same thing, uh, the same kind of analysis in delta S is equal to minus one mode, which is more dominant. Unfortunately, the electroweak penguin uh, pollution uh, con uh, will pollute the measured phase if it do exactly the same thing. However, the pollution can be estimated using the theoretical relation between C and P W. So uh, this is more likely to be done earlier, but we wanted to present a clean method first and then come up with this. So, oops, sorry. Let me just conclude. We have demonstrated that both, both correlations arise from two body intermediate states, uh, intermediate decay, uh, two intermediate decays, that is, Sigma B, uh, chi B minus to sigma prime. I'm sorry, I missed the prime here. Pi minus and uh, chi B minus sigma prime minus pi zero contributing to the final state lambda zero pi, uh, pi minus pi zero. Similar correlations arise in the conjugate mode. And uh, it is because of this, we are able to generate interference very much like the uh, D and D bar mode, we are able to generate interference between two amplitudes that enable us to measure the weak phase. The mode is conveniently chosen so as to have reparameterization, variance, validity, and the weak phase can be measured by using the even and odd contributions to the amplitudes under pine exchange, comparing mode and conjugate, and also by comparing mode and conjugate uh, mode correlation plots. Okay. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions and comments? We probably can only take one question. I don't see any hand. OK, thank you very much. Let's Thank move you. to the last much. talk of this session about the CP violation and the CKM measurement with beauty decays at IHCB by Jody. Yes, please. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. 
So uh, let's start. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today, albeit virtual, to present on behalf of the LHB collaboration. My name is Jordi Butter. I'm a fourth year PhD student at NICAF Amsterdam, and I'm going to uh, present uh, about CP violation and CQM measurement with beauty decays at LHB. So I'm starting with a very quick reminder of the CQM matrix, which you've probably already seen a lot. Uh, this is a three by three matrix, which links the weak and mass eigenstates. And this uh, has a few important properties. First of all, that's a complex matrix and it has complex faces like gamma, for example. It's, uh, it's unitary. And from this unitarity, you can construct a unitarity triangle, which is also shown on the right. And one of these angles uh, you can see there is the CQM angle gamma. This is a standard candle for the standard model. And it has a negligible theoretical uncertainty. And an indirect way of obtaining this is uh, through the uh, a global fit, which is a fit to the uh, unitarity triangle and all the parameters in it. And this is done by the CQM fitter group with, in a frequentist approach and by the UT fit group in an Bayesian approach. And they've obtained a value of about 65.8 with a small uncertainty and uh, the experimental uncertainty on this is uh, currently still larger. So our uh, goal as experimentalists now is to uh, close this gap and see if there are any deviations between uh, other measurements and uh, gamma. So today um, we'll focus on uh, gamma measurements and about uh, the BS oscillation frequency delta MS. So first of all, the LHCB combination of gamma then a gamma measurement using B2D H decays. Then I will uh, discuss a CPS symmetry measurements of a baryonic decay. Then uh, a gamma, gamma and delta MS using the time dependent uh, measurement BS to DS H pi pi. Then only delta MS using BS to DS pi. And finally, uh, BD to DS pi. Related talks are one of yesterday of Malcolm and today as well, later today uh, in the session by Johan about uh, the charm equivalent. So the LHCB detector, uh, you can, uh, you've probably already seen, but two very important things uh, to mention are for this measurements are excellent time resolution. This is very important for uh, measurements like Delta MS and also the particle identification with two dedicated rich detectors to differentiate uh, ions from kaons, for example. So if we want to measure gamma in LHB, we use B to the H decays. And we, for this, uh, uh, what we need is uh, decay, uh, which uh, two amplitudes. And, and one of them is a favored B to C transition. And one of them has a suppressed B to U uh, amplitude. These are uh, typically B plus to D uh, H plus. And, and where the D is a mixture of D zero and D zero bar. And this D0 and D0 bar then decay to the same final stage, which can be two kaons, two uh, pions, or kaon and pion, for example. And an uh, the, the diagram of it, this is uh, shown on the right. Important parameters here are RB and RD, which is uh, a ratio of the magnitudes of these uh, amplitudes. And the delta B and the delta D is the strong phase difference uh, between these amplitudes. And gamma is, of course, the parameter of interest. Uh, another way of uh, measuring gamma is, uh, can be done uh, using uh, interference between mixing and decay, which are the time dependent analysis. Uh, an example of this is also bs to ds k pi pi, which I will show you uh, later in this uh, talk. But first of all, the LHB combination of the CQM and no gamma. Uh, a new feature of this combination is that the beauty sector is combined with the charm sector. And because there are now so many input measurements and so much data that uh, we've obtained a very good precision on gamma and delta B. And this enables us to also constrain this uh, strong phase difference in the D uh, to a factor two better than the world average. And this means that uh, we can also uh, improve the charm mixing knowledge significantly by adding the charm sector. So all the input uh, parameters are uh, input analysis are on the right. You can see that many of them have been updated or are new since the 2018 uh, uh, combination. Um, External constraints are mainly hadronic parameters and coherence factors, and also uh, phi s, for example. 
and this combination uses a frequentist approach. The result uh, is, uh, has an uncertainty of only 4%, with a value of 65.4 degrees. This is uh, in very good agreement with the globe and fits, and it's the most precise determination by a single experiment. Um, also, uh, as I said, it's combined with the charm sector and the charm mixing parameters have been improved very drastically, especially Y, uh, which has been improved by a factor of two. And just as a reminder, uh, the mass difference in charm has only been observed very recently, as you can see in this following link. Uh, as cross-checks, uh, um, the beauty part, uh, part was cross-check using Bayesian uh, approach, also uh, an independent frequentist framework. Uh, the charm results are then also validated by reproducing the HLF results. Then um, gamma measurements of B to DH, uh, which uh, has just been arrived in archive. Uh, this analysis looks at the uh, D going to two hadrons and a pi zero. And because of this, uh, hadron can be a pi on and a k on. There are eight uh, final states uh, analyzed. Four of them are quasi ADS, uh, quasi ADS modes and four of them crazy GLW modes. This quasi ADS, uh, one of, uh, two of them are uh, uh, favored and two are suppressed. And one of this uh, suppressed uh, is observed with a 7.8 uh, sig sigma significance. And because we fit the uh, all the final states and it's uh, uh, and also the charge conjugates, we uh, fit to sixteen uh, subsamples. And on the right, you see an example of the suppressed quasi ADAs modes. And using all these uh, invariant mass fits, we obtain eleven ratios and asymmetries, which are then interpreted in terms of gamma, R B, and delta B. The results uh, are also shown in this plot. And here you see that there's a global minimum at 145 degrees. But there's also a second solution on the left of there, which is uh, zoomed in on the right. And here you see that this is much closer to the LHB combination, uh, which came out a bit earlier than this analysis. And this value of this minimum is uh, 56, deg uh, 56 degrees. And the corresponding uh, delta B and RB are also mentioned. Then there's also CP asymmetry measurement using uh, let the B to D proton K on. This uh, is done to uh, the favored uh, K minus pi plus and the suppressed K plus pi minus. The suppressed mode is observed in this analysis. And this is performed to two uh, regions of phase space. First of all, the full phase space and also a restricted phase space in terms of proton chaos mass. Uh, this restricted phase space uh, was uh, analyzed just to uh, because there is an uh, amplified interference expected around this region. And the parameters of interest are the ratio of the branching fractions and the asymmetry. As you can see in the red box, the, the results of the two phase spaces are very well compatible. The, Asymmetry is uh, uh, an agreement with zero still. And if we want to extract gamma from this, we would need a bit more data. Then uh, BSUDS H pi pi to measure gamma and delta mass. Uh, this analysis analyzes, first of all, BS to DS pi pi pi, which is a flavor for specific, specific decay to extract uh, delta mass, as you can see in the right bottom. And also to as an, uh, to uh, calibrate the detector induced effects for the BSUDS K pi pi uh, mode. This is actually uh, what we use to extract gamma because it's sensitive to gamma minus two beta s. As you can see on the right two diagrams, they both decay to the same final states. And because of uh, BS mixing, they will interfere with each other. An extra complication is that uh, this is a four body decay. So there are uh, strong uh, there's a strong phase variation among the phase space because of uh, intermediate resonances. And if taking this into into account, you will get a gamma value of four, uh, 44 to the of 12. And the delta mass value is also sh shown here. 
uh, cross check has been done to uh, uh, check uh, also integrated phase space, and this gave the same results. But the uh, comma was, of course, a bit diluted. Then uh, the delta mass using BS to DS pi. This is uh, the most sensitive mode uh, to the delta mass. They use DS to KK pi and DS to pi pi pi. And this analysis consists of two main parts. First, an invariant mass fit, in which the BS and the DS invariant mass are fitted to obtain uh, uh, S weights to uh, subtract the backgrounds uh, statistically. You can see that's a very clean mode and uh, with 380,000 events. And this background subtract the data is then used in the decay time fit to obtain delta MS. Uh, other ingredients of this decay time fit are also knowledge about the initial flavor of the BS, if it was the BS or BS bar. Uh, we have to model the decay time acceptance, the decay time error has to be calibrated, and then a decay time bias because of fellow misalignment has to be uh, corrected for. And all in all, this uh, resulted in the following delta mass measurements which is uh, by far the most precise measurement of uh, delta mass so far. And the main systematics here are the uh, detector misalignments in the Fellow modules and the knowledge of the length scale. Five minutes. Yes. And then uh, the delta mass measurements are combined with other measurements from uh, BSD SPY uh, 2011, BS to GHFI and BS to DS pi pi, which I've just mentioned, to arrive at the LHCB legacy measurement of the current LHCB detector of this value. Finally, uh, I show you a measurement of the branching fraction of B to DS pi. Um, this uh, uses a normalization channel B to D pi. And the di diagram you can see uh, on the right, uh, it goes through phi B. This means that it's uh, suppressed compared to uh, another similar decay BS to DS pi. This you can see also in the invariant MOSFETs, where uh, BS to DS pi is the big peak, but we actually want to measure this tiny blob, which is red. So it's very important to really model this uh, background and the signal. Another thing to, uh, and this we did, and we got the following uh, results. And as I said, uh, this goes for VOB, so we can use this decay to probe VOB. But uh, as we've seen uh, today and yesterday, uh, non leptonic decays are kind of difficult because of uh, non factorizable uh, QCD effects between the DS uh, meson and the pion. And there's no theoretical prediction for this. So actually, what we measure is the product of VOB and, uh, and ANF. ANF is uh, what we call what we encapsulate all these effects in. Then this measurement can also be used uh, as an input for CP violation measurements in B2D pi. This is because uh, this decay looks very much like the suppressed B2D pi decay, except this we have a DS meson here instead of a D meson. And as we assume SU3 symmetry with an uncertainty of 20%, we get the following result of RD pi. Uh, finally, uh, we can also use. Uh, uh, the yields of BS to DS pi, so the big peak here instead of the small one, and the normalization channel B to D pi to uh, get a uh, ener collision energy dependence of the hadronization fractions. And the hadronization fractions are an input for all our uh, BS uh, branching fraction measurements, like BS to mu mu, for example. So to conclude, we've uh, obtained a, a gamma value of only with only 4% uncertainty which is the most precise determination of a gamma by single experiment. And we've also obtained delta mass with a record precision uh, and which is com then combined to be in a, a legacy measurement of our, the current detector LHV. And for the upgrades, upgrades we obtain, uh, we expect a dramatic increase in data. So there are very good prospects uh, ahead. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Any questions and comments? I don't see any 
Okay. It's very clear. <laughs> so thank you very much. So thank you. I think let's have a break. So I don't know whether the organizer, local organizer, want to say something before the break. Uh, as I'm here, I can thank you for sharing uh, and, and all the speakers for, for their talks, but uh, no particular uh, announcement. Enjoy the break and uh, we'll continue at 20 past the hour.